In this video, we're going to review integral calculus. Now, uh, integral calculus is really the other piece of calculus, differential calculus being the first and integral calculus being the second. And there's two ways that you can view integral calculus through two different lenses. Uh, the first is as the antiderivative. And we'll talk about what that means in a second, right? But um, this is the first way to view integral calculus as the antiderivative. Or uh, integral calculus can also be viewed as the summation of infinitely small elements, right? So the summation of small elements. Right now, you've probably spent a lot of time focused on this definition of the integral and this kind of lens of integral calculus. In most math classes, there's a lot of time spent on looking at nuts and bolts of how to solve integrals, the different rules, the different approaches and strategies to solve difficult integrals. But um, I would argue that this portion of integral calculus is not as important to the actual physical understanding of what an integral actually is. And all of that physical understanding is really locked away in this lens of integral calculus, viewing integrals as the summation of infinitely small elements, right? Um, and it, it creates this really beautiful symphony between differential calculus and integral calculus, where differential calculus is chopping uh, the problem up into these really, really small pieces, and integral calculus is summing them back up over the region of, of that you're interested in for the function, right? So, uh, so first, let's kind of review uh, integral calculus as through the lens of the antiderivative, just so we're on the same page. And then we'll go through this integral calculus um, lens of, you know, as a summation of small elements, right? So first, let's consider some function, right? Let's consider a function y that is a function of x, right? So y is equal to f of x, some function x. Um, and we know that we can take the derivative, right? So we can say that dy over dx is our derivative. Right, so basically what you would be doing is differentiating this function of x with respect to x. So I've been using the Leibniz notation. Um, another notation that's useful is the prime notation where uh, you can express the first derivative as f prime of x. And that's gonna be useful for writing out um, different things related to the integral in this video. So, uh, so this is the prime notation. So basically f prime of x means the first derivative of x. Now you can actually write this out in a differential form where you can say that dy is equal to f prime of x dx. So essentially what this does is sets up the derivative as an as a, a differential equation, right? So this is, uh, I'll write out that this is the differential form. Right, basically turning this derivative into a differential equation. Now, um, what the integral is asking is basically addressing a, a question, right? Let's say that you have f prime of x, you have the first derivative, but uh, you want to know what was the original function that produced that derivative, right? So what function, so what function f of x produces f prime of x right so instead of you know being given a function and looking for its derivative you have the derivative and you want to know what function produced that outcome right so this is where the integral comes into play you can solve for f of x by taking the integral so this little curly uh long looking s is the integral sign and is basically you can take the integral of that function that you're interested in in order to get the original function that produced that derivative. So this symbol is the integral symbol. Right, the symbol of integration. And what's the function that's in um, that's inside the integral here is referred to as the integrand. 
So integrand. Um, so this is basically what the derivative is, right? And so you can kind of see why we view it as the antiderivative. It's literally asking, you know, how did we get to this derivative? So in order to, to answer that question, you basically piece backwards the, the differentiation in order to solve for the function. So let's look at a, a quick example just to, to go through this, right? Let's say our f prime of x is 2x. Right. So let's say we have two X as our um, as our derivative. Right. And we want to know what function originally produced that. Well, uh, we can just solve the integral. Right. So we would integrate two X dx. Right. And since we're trying to sol solve for the original function, basically, you're going to um, basically going to do the derivative in reverse. Take the anti derivative. Right. And there's general rules for this, but you can kind of look at this by inspection and just tell um, that this should be X squared as the function that produces this derivative. Right. For two X, you basically do your power rule in reverse. So we know that F of X would be equal to two X. Now, an important note here um, is that whenever you have this integral sign with nothing there, uh, this is known as an indefinite integral. This means that you don't know what region of space you're evaluating this integral with respect to. So um, you don't necessarily know. Oh, whoops. I wrote a two X here. I meant that our function should be X squared. There we go. So, um, so yeah, so you, what I was saying is that you don't know, um, what region of space you're evaluating this with respect to. So the function here could also have a constant, right? So we have to add a constant, what we call the constant of integration C, um, in order to, to be general enough to what the function could have been, right? Cause, uh, it could have been X squared plus five. It could have been X squared plus six. It could have just been X squared, right? But we, uh, add that constant of integration just to cover our basis and be general enough with the indefinite integral. So, um, so this is just a quick review of integration, right? This is what the nuts and bolts that you are already familiar with, uh, from calculus one, calculus two. Um, as far as how to do these integrals. Now, what I want to spend a little bit more or just kind of introduce to you, if it hasn't already, is this idea of the integral as the summation of small elements. So one thing that we'll do a lot in physical chemistry in the early portions of this class um, is look at what happens when a gas is expanding uh, or contracting, right? When you have a gas sample that's expanding or contracting, um, and, and one thing that we'll do is characterize the work done in that process. And what you'll find out is that the work done in that process is the uh, area under the curve of a pressure volume curve like the one I have here. So the green line would be the dependence of pressure on volume. Right. So um, so you have some line like this. Right. Um, and you want to figure out the area underneath this curve. Well, one way that you can approximate the area under that curve, right? So I'll say that this is the approximate area is to just draw a bunch of rectangles, right? Uh, under the area of the curve and get the area of these rectangles and sum them up, right? That would be the best way to approximate this area under the curve. Now, obviously you can see that this is not the best approximation currently. We have four rectangles. Some of them are overshooting and undershooting the uh, function at different points, but this is a good starting point. So basically you would take the area of each rectangle and sum it, right? So um, the distance here for these rectangles we'll refer to as delta V. So the area of the first rectangle would just be P1 delta V. The second one would be P2 delta V. Right, we're just showing where these rectangles, the height of these rectangles, right? Uh, P3 delta V plus P4 delta V. Right now, um, I didn't exactly draw these to scale, but all of these rectangles will have the exact same delta V. So I tried to draw them as close together uh, as possible, but all of them will have the same displacement delta V, right? So this is an approximate area. We can rewrite this in summation notation, right? Where you have different pressures times delta V, 
right? It's just rewriting this in, in summation notation. We have four different pressures, four different rectangles. We sum over all of those, right? So this gives you your approximate area. So now we want to think about how we could possibly improve upon this approximation. Like I said, we've we've done a pr fairly poor job here with just four rectangles um, that, like I said, is kind of overshooting and undershooting the function at different points. Right. Uh, so and let me actually not I want to call this in. This should be four. Right. So one way that we could improve this is to um, is to increase the number of rectangles. Right. So basically, we just keep cutting this up into smaller and smaller bits so that we're not overshooting and undershooting the function quite as much. Right. So basically, we would want to get as many rectangles as possible to approximate the area. Right. And let me use a different color here. Right, so to approximate the area, we want to use as many rectangles as possible, right? So we will basically want to do this sum as much as we can, right? Have as many rectangles as possible. So we'll want the limit of this as n approaches infinity, where we sum over as many rectangles as possible. Right. So instead of just these four rather large rectangles, we would have infinitely skinny uh, rectangles that would approximate the area much better. Now, as you do this, uh, take this limit out to infinity, as you increase the number of rectangles, obviously you're going to decrease this delta V. Right. If you subdivide this once, right, that's going to decrease delta v subdivided again and again and again delta v is going to get infinitely small so what you're really doing here is taking the limit as delta v goes to zero right of this sum right so you're you're cutting up the problem into infinitely small pieces and summing them up over a specific region, right? And that is exactly what differential and integral calculus is meant to do here. It's this interplay between cutting up the problem into infinitely small pieces and summing them back up. So basically you can rewrite this as an integral, right? So you would integrate from some volume V1 to a final volume V2 of the pressure over dv, where dv is an infinitely small volume region that you're cutting the problem up into uh, and then summing back up over this region. So this really gives you the physical significance of the integral, right? And, and this will help you know when it's really appropriate to use calculus and not, right? Uh, whenever you wanna apply calculus is when you want to figure out the change of some function um, or I guess, you know, some property of a function over a specific region, right? That's when it's appropriate to use calculus, where you can cut the problem up into these really small pieces and then be able to sum them back up over the region that you're interested in. That's exactly what th solving this type of integral would do here. This area would give us the area under this curve, which for this case that we're interested in would give us the work done by an expanding or contracting gas. So, um, so basically the purpose of this video was just to review um, some of the nuts and bolts of integration, but also kind of add on that physical significance. And when we're solving integrals in this class, I want you to always keep in the back of your mind, what's the physical significance of this integral? If What does solving this integral tell me about the property that I'm interested in? And always keep that definition of integral calculus as, you know, summing up these different infinitesimal pieces if you keep that in your mind, then it'll always be fairly easy to answer the question of what is the physical significance of the integral.